okay folks you're live we can start now thanks hello everyone thank you for joining us today at the first panoptic talk event this event is being conducted this event is being conducted under IFF's Project Panoptic, which is India's first facial recognition systems tracker that aims to bring transparency and accountability to the development and deployment of these systems while also advocating for policy change. One of the reasons we launched, launched Project Panoptic was that there was li very little conversation around how the sample technology is being developed and deployed across the country. We wanted to raise awareness around this issue and through our project inform people about the secretive nature nature of the deployment of this surveillance technology. With the launch of the Panoptic Talk series, we aim to take this effort forward by calling experts from India and abroad to discuss the intricacies of the ethical, legal, and technical ramifications of this technology to ensure that IFF's community and the larger audience can benefit from the experience from those who work tirelessly on this issue. Today, we have with us Pallavi Bedi, Aman Nair, and Shweta Mohandas from the Center of Internet and Society, who have recently authored a research paper titled Facial Recognition Technology in India. Pallavi is a senior policy officer at CIS, where she works on privacy and data protection. Aman is a policy officer at CIS focused on researching data governance, financial technologies, and the platform economy. And Shweta is also a policy of officer at CIS where she's currently researching the growing use of FRT in India. Before we start our discussion, Pallavi, Aman, and Shweta will make a short presentation on the paper. The floor is yours, guys. Go ahead. Thanks, Anushka. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us as well. Um, so before uh, we begin, I thought it would just be uh, useful if we could give a little bit of background and context to the study we did and the paper that came out of it. Um, Shweta, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, this study was the result of a collaboration between CIS and the University of Essex. Uh, the research project initially was looking to focus on the use uh, by law enforcement for surveillance purposes, uh, but we've since expanded that to look at tangential uses of FRT as well. Uh, this paper is the first part of that research project uh, where we look to map out the use cases of FRT in India and understand how those use cases are fit within the country's wider legal and judicial framework. So those are some of the questions we uh, aim to answer, you know, what are the technological issues associated with FRT, where have they been deployed, how does it impact the right to privacy, what are the framing it? How do these approaches differ globally and how do we structure a regulatory framework going forward? Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the first question obviously is what is FRT? Uh, really simply put, FRT is just an automated process of comparison of faces to determine whether they are virtual. So a simple way of thinking about this is that a picture is first uploaded onto an FRC, FRT system and using a feature analysis algorithm, uh, certain distinctive features of a face such as a person's nose, eyes, the distance between their eyes and whatnot are measured and then converted into a mathematical representation that's known as a face template. This face template is then compared against facial data that's collected and stored in a database and the end user is ultimately provided with a score or a percentage that represents the likelihood that the two image the same person. Um, so FRT uh, currently are come with very specific limitations. Uh, so the accuracy of these modern FRT systems is wholly dependent on a large number of ways, most obviously being the quality of the images that are being compared, right? Um, there are also sort of external factors, you know, whether the person in the image was wearing makeup, whether there are images, uh, whether the differences in lighting, whether they now have facial hair. These are massive problems that lead to a large issue of inaccurate readings. So these limitations also pose certain potential dangers. Uh, because of their unpredictable nature, right? So the first is uh, identified by the system. So FRT systems have been demonstrated across various jurisdictions, across various studies to consistently produce inaccurate results due to the number of variables involved in the process. And this kind of ties into the second problem, which is that of discrimination and bias. So each looking at the US and the UK has shown that FRT systems are more likely to produce false positives when the individuals are people of color or marginalized communities, which in India can be an incredibly uh, dangerous uh, outcome of using FRT systems. The third issue would be that FRT could theoretically be used to curb political dissonance. Uh, we saw uh, what could be considered an example of this in December 2019 when the Delhi police 
uh, deployed FRT to monitor a crowd at a rally that was featuring the prime minister. And finally, the last issue would be that of data breaches. So absence of a dedicated personal data protection bill. There are concerns over the data that's collected and used for, uh, by these systems and individuals rights over them. Uh, sure. Next slide, thanks. So as part of our study, we try to identify some of the more prominent use cases of FRT being done by the state. Um, this spans surveillance tangential areas. Uh, the first of these was Digi Yatra, which was a pilot program that was launched in 2018 by the Ministry of Civil Aviation, uh, where it attempts to use FRT for passenger identity verification at airports. Uh, the second one was Aadhaar verification. So as part of the multi-factor authentication process for Aadhaar, uh, in 2018, the UIDAI came out and acknowledged that facial recognition and facial verification would now be an acceptable form of identity, identity verification. Um, this sort of brings us to the most, I would say, flagship uh, program that uses FRT in India, which is the National Automated Facial Recognition System, or the AFRS. Um, this system essentially consists of a centralized database that uses image and video data from a number of pan-Indian and state databases, and is supposed to be able to identify or verify an individual from digital images, videos, sketches, and even live CCTV footage. Next slide, please, Shabar. Thanks. So, yeah, so this also brings us to sort of the related surveillance related uses of FRT. Um, so, in 2018, the Delhi High Court sanctioned the use of FRT to identify missing children. Um, we've already spoken, I guess, about the use of FRT for political protests and to curb political dissonance. And finally, there's also been use by individual state uh, police departments, uh, such as Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu, for policing and other surveillance purposes. Yeah, so legislative discussions around FRT is one of the things we looked at in the study to try and understand what the general consensus in the legislature was on uh, FRT. And what we found that was as of July 2021, there has been no substantive discussion on the AFRS in parliament and only one question raised about it, which was the Rajya Sabha. Um, however, both uh, houses of parliament seem to have questions raised about FRT, though those questions seem to be more inclined towards individual instances of their use. So for example, the use of FRT uh, on students are looking to access their CBSC uh, marks. Um, uh, but there's a complete lack of depth in any of these discussions or in any of these questions. And it kind of indicates that the executive is uh, sort of leading the charge on the use of FRT in India and the, the legislature is being incredibly reactive as opposed to being proactive. Yeah, so um, I think now I'll hand over to Pallavi who will speak a bit about the sort of legislative framework that's been governing the use of FRT so far in India. Pallavi, over to you. Thank you, Aman. Uh, so, okay, uh, so currently um, we have, sorry, there's no law which governs FRT in India, which as Aman sort of referred to earlier. Uh, one yeah. of the problems that comes out with the lack of a law is that it impacts your right to privacy any use of FRT has a right impact on the right of privacy. Now, in Supreme Court, in the Puttaswamy case, when it upheld or said that the right to privacy is a fundamental right, it very clearly articulated that any imposition or any infringement on the right to privacy has to be through a, has to satisfy a threefold test, which is what's been written down. It has to be an existence of a law, it has to be a legitimate state aim, and it has to be proportional. The de deployment of FRT has to be proportional. Now, currently, there is no legislative sanction for the use of FRT in the country, uh, either by the state or by the private entity. Uh, we will, uh, going forward, we will see how FRT is being used for different purposes, by, for, by law enforcement, by, uh, for, for education purposes, it's being used at the airports, but there is no overarching framework de defining the use of FRT or giving it any sanction. Uh, in fact, when the AFRS had come out, I think IFF had sent a legal notice and they, the Ministry of Home Affairs had said that a, there was a cabinet note they referred to, which had been passed, I think, in 2009, and which they relied on that cabinet note to say that the AFRS is got legal sanction. But as I think is very well known, a cabinet note is not a statutory enactment. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not passed by the uh, legislature. It's just a note which can't take, uh, which doesn't confer any legislative authority over it. Uh, which is also what the Supreme Court has very clearly said in the Aadhaar case also, where they said that an executive notification does not satisfy the requirement of a valid law. So it has to be, a valid law has to be something which has to be passed by parliament. 
which has not happened so far. Uh, just to come, like I'll get touched back to this. There is also, uh, if in, I will go through it in the next slide also, uh, a talk about, for example, you have the Information Technology Act. Uh, you have certain sections on the IT Act, which look at sort of govern the surveillance framework in India, which is a very patchy governance. It's not pure, but that's what the gov government really re relies upon. If you look at section 69 and section 69B, there are two sections where the government sort of relies upon those sections for surveillance mechanisms. But those sections, especially section 69, for example, looks at interception and decryption of information. And 69B talks about monitoring of data. All of that looks at data information as defined under the Information Technology Act. That in no way takes into account the beast known as FRT. It doesn't cover that at all. So there is, I mean, even if you the government says we have a surveillance mechanism, there is there are laws governing surveillance. That uh, the existing laws definitely don't seem to cover that, at least under the ID Act. Uh, the second prong that they have to look at is legitimate state aim. As I think Aman sort of referred to earlier, there is no state aim. Like we don't know what FRT is being used for. It's being used for, for law enforcement purposes. It's being used at airports. It's being used for educational purposes. It's also now for the vaccination purposes was being used in vaccination. So there is no one state aim. Uh, it's being used to miss, uh, locate missing children. So what is the aim for why FRT is being used? It's being used for different purposes. So it's very unclear or difficult to define what the use of FRT is. So it sort of falls foul of the second test that Puttaswamy laid down. The third, which is also proportionality, uh, obviously FRT is bulk surveillance, right? It's not targeting one individual. So if it wants to target one person in that sense, it captures the images of people surrounding that individual also. So it's not, uh, and it's over a large segment of population. So that obviously has a disproportionate impact on the marginalized community on communities that maybe the government wants to surveil or, or has an impact on their civil liberties also. Which in fact, in the Aadhaar judgment, the Supreme Court had clearly said that you can't surveil an entire population when, the, when they want to link Aadhaar with, phone, uh, with your phone data, with sorry, SIM cards, they said you can't use uh, sort of say that entire population is a criminal and sort of do surveillance of all of that. That's not proportionate. So that's how it struck that down, the linkage of your Aadhaar with your mobile SIM data. So similarly, an FRT is obviously going to do bulk surveillance, right? It's not going to be limited to one individual. So it's not proportional. So it's a false fall, flower of the Puttuswami judgment. Can you go to the next slide, please, Shweta? Yeah, so now if you look at the legal framework and FRT in India, as Aman mentioned earlier, there is the personal data protection bill, which is still pending in parliament. Now, under the personal data protection bill, uh, facial images, iris scan, they all fall within the definition of biometric data. And biometric data comes under the sensitive personal data protect, uh, sensitive personal data definition under the PTP bill. Uh, and that requires a different level of processing. The data, which is personal data and sensitive personal data, requires a different, it's classified differently, and processing of sensitive personal data has to be processed differently. Now, the PDP bill also gives the power to the data protection authority to notify certain existing data fiduciaries or new data fiduciaries as significant data fiduciaries if they employ new technology based on sensitivity of the processing of personal data. And no processing of genetic or any other source of sensitive personal data can be undertaken unless the data fiduciaries undertake a data protection impact assessment. So sort of gives a broad way overview of that if you're going to take any kind of new uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of a process or kind of take any processing of genetic or biometric data, you need to undertake a data protection impact assessment. But where the problem comes is the exemption that's given to the, to the central government. So the PDB bill also, I think is known, gives an exemption to the central government under clause 35 to exempt any agency, uh, to exempt any agency from all or any of the provisions of the bill. And that uh, by written note order, they can exempt it if they think uh, it's necessary for the sovereignty, security, safety. Uh, and they can just exempt any agency. And then so that by that logic, uh, they can also exempt uh, the, the agency from the purview of the DPA, from the Data Protection Authority. So the, power, the DPA sort of becomes ineffective in conducting investigation into the use of FRT by a law enforcement agency or any other agency that, the, that who wants to use FRT and saying that you need to impact, have a data protection impact assessment. So in that sense, the PDP bill as it stands currently, 
and we don't think we will really regulate FRT in India. Shweta, uh, Shweta can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, sorry, like I said, uh, we had, uh, referred to this earlier also, the FRT and the Information Technology Act. So the two sections that the government sort of refer, relies upon for surveillance generally are Section 69 and Section 69B. Section 69 and its associated rules talk about establishing grounds and procedures for agents to intercept, decrypt, and monitor information generated or transmitted and stored in any computer resource. And 69B talks about, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 69 was interception, 69B is monitoring of data. Uh, so once we were looking at this question, we did think, can the state fall back on the Information Technology Act and say, we do have a law, or um, it's just merely an extension of the you know, powers that we've given, given on the IT Act. But like I had mentioned earlier, those two sections don't uh, sort of cover facial recognition technology because that is a completely different technology. The IT Act does not cover that. And those two sections also talk about targeted surveillance. It's not about mask and bulk surveillance, which is what FRT is. So, um, and again, like I said, it could be used, uh, IT Act can be used by uh, the state say that we are to justify collection of CCTV feeds for that, uh, to use that. And that it's a little unclear whether this data could be used as a part of the FRT infrastructure and how that will play into the, to the FRT infrastructure. But I don't think those two sections of the IT Act sort of give them any legal basis, uh, give the government any base, legal basis to deploy FRT. Uh, next slide, please, Shweta. Yeah, so these are the two other uh, non-information technology frameworks that we could look at, is the Code of Criminal Procedure, which are the two sections in which, section 91 and 92, which again, uh, authorize police and the court to, uh, for example, section 91 is where the police officer or the court can summon or ask for the production of a document or anything which they believe is required in the investigation of a case. Uh, and that's how, the, for example, uh, police takes, uh, you know, cell phone data, or but that's data that is, that is present, that is at set and not, uh, not like the IT Act comes in for it, like the information technology, but phone data or that, that you know, you get data, or the court orders or the police gets that data under section 91 and 92. Uh, and again, under C section 144 of the CRPC, which we know about is when the police can say that, you know, they impose section 144 and say, to, and they authorize, they, they say that you do something and, you know, prevent, uh, for example, protesters from gathering at a place, for more than five people from gathering at the place. So they can use, I mean, what can happen is that what we can, what we saw is that they can use the section 91, 92, read with 144 to get feeds from CCTV data and to uh, sort of use that to then have information about people at protest sites. Like, sorry, like what Aman referred to, they were using CCTV data previously. So yeah, that it could be used. And I'm sorry, I'm right, sort of, I think going beyond my time. So that is just ending it. And I think next slide, Amon can take over. Thanks, Pallavi. Yeah, um, so I think we can just skip the international perspective section and just go straight to the recommendations. Um, actually, Pallavi, could you take this one and then I'll take the next recommendation. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's, I think I've spoken a lot about this already. Uh, what we thought in while we're looking at it is that we need, I think, a comprehensive and cohesive legal and regulatory framework which is based on necessity, the principles are laid down there, so I'm not going to read it all out, based on the principle of necessity, proportionality. Uh, what we believe is that Puttuswami talks about necessity and proportionality, but we think the necessity will be strict necessity. I mean, how do you define necessity? It will be strict. There should be no other means of achieving that. That also fulfills the proportionality test. Uh, there's also oversight, accountability, and redress, because obviously if I am having, if you are using FRT and I believe that, you know, I have sort of some sort of grievance that has to be an accountability redress mechanism and data protection impact assessment that I spoke about earlier, that needs to be there. And there should be obviously the construct, consent structures, notice structures that I should be allowed to give consent. It should be an opt in for non-criminal or for certain cases, consent needs to be taken, uh, which are non-criminal. We can identify which are the structures and notice needs to be given. Uh, and similarly, uh, retention and deletion standards. How long will you retain the data? Where will you retain? Who's go how can you delete it? Uh, and the last, I think, is just uh, harmonization of technical. And I don't think there's any, we don't know what the standards are being used, what technological standards are being, what statistical standards are being used. So that needs to be harmonized across law enforcement purposes. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, do you want to take that, Amun? Yeah. yeah. So 
I guess the next sort of major recommendation we have is that there has to be a lot more clarity regarding questions around scope and structure and the processes involved in the actual use of FRT. Uh, again, like since we're running late, I don't think we need to go through each individual one, but generally just an understanding for individuals Know, the basis on which databases are created, how all data is selected for these databases, how they're organized, the role of the algorithms, um, the technical standards used in these uh, databases, and, and so on. Uh, Shata, the next slide, please. And finally, we have sort of the last remaining recommendations, which is, again, we have to clarify the use of FRT as with any uh, future PDP bill, uh, the need for more comprehensive and harmonized uh, regulations of CCTVs, which form the backbone for much of FRT systems. Um, then more, uh, let's say, like generic uh, recommendations in terms of we need high, more capacity building for among end users, uh, greater public discourse and engagement on the topic, and finally more uh, research into the impact of FRT systems. Okay, that's right. Uh, so with regards to the upcoming research and the next papers we will write on this, so we're looking at uh, the use of FRT. I think through 2021, you've seen the use of FRT in different uh, different areas or different areas of our life, including education institutions, there's for law enforcement, definitely the airports, also for vaccination programs. So there are new public and private offices or public and private organizations that are going to use FRT for different purposes, with access control or for recognition. So we're just looking at what are the new upcoming uses of new use of FRT in India. Uh, we're also looking at what is the study of civil society voices in FRT and what concerns they've raised about this. Um, including IFF, so looking at what are the, and what are their legal, ethical, and regulatory reservations that they have towards the use of FRT in India. And, uh, but also look at this highlight of this, just looking at what the spectrum of possible regulation can be. Uh, sorry, possible regulation can be, and it, so is that there's going to be a complete ban or there's complete use without any ban. So just look at what are the other scope of regulation for the use of FRT in India. Great, thank you so much, all three of you. That was a really, you know, I really understand the paper now. Um, so the, my first question actually to you guys is why did you do this? Like when and why did CIS decide that they're going to do an extended series on facial recognition? Was there a single FRT system that, you know, nudged you to look at this granularly or was it because, you know, everywhere you were hearing FRT for this, FRT for that. So how did this whole thing come about? So yeah, uh, it sort of came about when uh, the University of Essex, like Aman said, it's been a collaboration with University of Essex, and they had come to us to look at the FRT landscape in India. Uh, initially, they came in, I think, 2019, and the initial aim or the thought was to look at the law enforcement use, how is law enforcement using FRT, and how the police in different states. When we started doing research, and that's for a time the, uh, the AFRS had been rolled out, so that was obviously that was some point of concern. We sort of, we sort of came to the conclusion, sort of understanding that there's not too much research, at least at that point, there was not too much research being done in F on FRT. We ha really had no idea what state governments are doing. How is it happening? And while we were doing the research, we realized, okay, it's being used in different for different purposes. And that's the time the Delhi High Court had sort of given, said you could use it for missing children. And they were like, that's going to be used for missing children. So I think, and then we, then the Digi Yatra had come out at the point time. So we've also sort of realized that it's not limited only to law enforcement or for law enforcement purposes, it's being used for different purposes also. So that's why we expanded the scope. And also to be, at that point, we really didn't know what the police is doing. They weren't answered, they weren't any questions being answered. It was like a, like a black box. So we said, okay, it's a black box. Let's like expand the scope a little bit. It's supposed to be law enforcement, but yeah, when we started looking at it, we said, okay, let's expand a little more. That's how it happened. Shweta, do you want to add in? Yeah. Um, so I think I can say about why I was interested in looking at FRT. So initially I was looking at AI systems and looking at what, how, what, what are the AI systems that are used for governance in India. And then we had the missing children. Like that was an example. And also I think the use of FRT is like scattered use, like scattered use reports of using FRT. Well, now you could actually see it being used in the field compared to maybe having tenders or government documents about it. So I think it makes sense to look at it right now to look at where FRT is going, how it is actually being used and what are the harms that are being caused right now. I agree. I think, I, that yeah. is what Panoptic is also trying to do. Um, my next question is to Aman and that is... Uh, so there are multiple use cases that you discussed in your paper for FRT, which according to you is the most dangerous and why do you think that is? Um, so I think it's uh, 
are clear that the AFRS presents like a very unique danger, uh, simply because of its scale, right? So I think uh, Pallavi like brilliantly like explain why any use of FRT would be a violation of individuals' privacy, but to scale it to the extent of the AFRS would be uh, truly unheard of. Um, so, you know, if you look at the original RFP uh, that the government put out for AFRS, they list a number of uh, databases that the AFRS could uh, integrate in itself into, thereby making it like an automatic candidate for you know, the most amount of facial recognition data in the country. And I think in the updated RFP, they even removed the list of uh, databases that so kind of giving them carte blanche, right? Like, so we don't really know the extent to which this can integrate into existing databases and sort of the threat that poses on individuals' rights. So the new RFP that came, I think on 24th of September, now they have mentioned three databases and then they have said that uh, any other database. So they have mentioned like these three, but also any other. So basically the same situation. You guys have also discussed in your paper that we do not have a specific regulation for FRT, even though it is being deployed so rapidly. So what are some of the clauses which you think are non-negotiable, which should be there in any FRT regulation that in the future is um, introduced by the government? And you did kind of answer this in your presentation, but if you could just a little expand on some specific uh, clauses that you think are extremely necessary and why? Pallavi. So I think one is obviously, like I mentioned, uh, is about the standards of necessity and proportionality. Uh, well, obviously, one, the first thing is we need to have a law, right? And I don't think that is very important. I, that, that the law should obviously uh, should have the stand, measure the standards of necessity and proportionality and that Necessity should be strict necessity. It should not be just you know general statement saying it should be necessary, but you should satisfy the sense of nece uh, strict necessity. The second should be oversight, accountability, and redress. I think we mentioned that also that there has to be clear mechanisms and bodies for oversight and accountability, uh, and they should be uh, there should be requirements for audit and transparency reports. That requirement there should be periodical transparency reports that should be issued and audits. Uh, the third, I think, also mentioned was the data protection impact assessment, which the PDP will refers to. But like as we said, the PDP bill also dilutes that. They can, the government can easily sort of exempt the agency from that uh, provision. So it's necessary to have a data protection impact assessment before the state government or any private sector, private actor also deploys FRT. They need, they need to do data protection impact assessment. And that uh, should also specify the measures that are going to be used for managing and mitigating the risk of harm. Uh, that could be caused by <clears throat> by the by the use of such uh, technology. Uh, the other thing that we had also talked about, which is something linked to the data protection impact, is a human right impact. So uh, when we were doing this study, we saw that there were uh, studies done by Freedom Online Coalition, which had recommended that prior to procuring and deploying FRT, a human rights impact assessment should also be undertaken which is I think which I, we think is something which should definitely be done to undertake, like I said, understand them and mitigate the potential harm that could happen because of FRT. Uh, one other thing that we also mentioned in, in the slide that I saw was consent and notice, because obviously consent needs to be taken uh, in stasis like non-criminal cases, for example, if you are going into an uh, airport, do I need to necessarily go through a DG Yatra thing or should, that consent needs to be taken? If we, at one point in time, uh, uh, we heard, they heard the Chai or said other like, private entities were using FRT. So obviously there has to be consent that needs to be obtained from the person if you're going to use FRT, deploying FRT on them. And similarly, along with consent, obviously comes notice that you need to give them notice that this is happening and we are going to take your information. What, what is the purpose of the information? How long is that information going to be retained? Who is going to, when is it going to be deleted? What is the purpose? Like I said, what's the purpose of that? And along like, purpose and all of that comes with your normal privacy principles, purpose limitation and collection limitation that is only going to be used for the purpose that you're using it for. So you're not going to use the, tech, the images that you've captured for any other purpose. You're not going to share it. It is not being used for criminal purposes with law enforcement agencies. So, and how long are you going to limit, you know, use it? How long are you going to retain it? Uh, so then with purpose limitation obviously comes your retention standards, your deletion standards, when are you going to delete it? But it, like Digi Yatra has a 
deletion deletion standard that they sort of come out with retention standards. Uh, and I think again with consent, I just mentioned opt in opt out standards. If you give me consent, then I should have a right to opt in to it or opt out of it. So yeah, those I think were certain things that we think should be included. But first, like just have a law which comes in, and then maybe we can just sort of discuss this further. But a law which is passed by parliament and which obviously has passes through the necessity and proportionality test rules. Yes, um, I agree. I think uh, just to um, go back to your answer, uh, you talked about oversight. So, which part of the government do you think should have oversight? in this situation <laughs> <laughs> i don't know whether it's a government thing or should be judicial oversight to be fair it could be a judicial oversight let's look at i mean then we, it goes back to the entire surveillance mechanism that the government okay. has deployed right this is my next question so <laughs> I that, that, yeah. 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 it's an entire surveillance mechanism it's a very patchy framework that we have right the government says for example in the it act you have a review committee but there is no judicial oversight of surveillance in india so far but you have a review committee God only knows when it meets and how it meets. We don't have any such information. Uh, so that definitely doesn't work. Or if it does work, at least I don't know about it. So there is no, any kind of oversight has to be a judicial oversight or legislative executive oversight on its own will not work, which we've seen. So I think it needs a complete overhaul of the surveillance mechanism, FRT being one of it, but a complete overhaul is required because it's a very patchy framework that we have right now. So um, coming to the surveillance architecture in India, we do have targeted surveillance provisions in the IT Act and the Telegraph Act, um, but we do not have anything that would tackle mass surveillance as FRT would do. So what changes do you think are necessary to be made in the current surveillance architecture in the country to combat the threat of state-sponsored mass surveillance? and? Also, does the PDP bill as it stands currently offer any concrete solutions to this situation? Uh, if I just get away, I, so I don't think the PDP bill is going to look at surveillance, right? It's not meant to be, it's supposed to be a data protection bill. So I think we get confused between data protection and surveillance and that's why the confusion arises. It's not supposed to be a surveillance bill. It's not supposed to regulate surveillance. So we need, like I just mentioned earlier, a proper surveillance architecture as to how is it going to happen. So uh, we do, like I, well, I think I mentioned it also, that mass surveillance, targeted surveillance requires a completely different overview of the surveillance mechanism. The PDP bill, and also the PDP will also, like I mentioned, the Clause 35 exempts the government, right? The government has the authority to exempt itself or any of its agencies. Once you give them that power, Obviously, there are chances, I mean, not obvious, but there are chances that any government would want to exempt ABCD agencies. And you have these different investigative agencies who have been who have the power, like you have authorized agencies, right, to investigate and do surveillance. So whether that's going, they're going to fall into the, P, uh, the PDP bill, whether the government's going to give them, exempt them, those are issues that need to be questioned and challenged. So I think basically what is required is a bill which looks at, or law which looks at mass surveillance, and looks at the issue that comes. So that could be facial recognition technology and generally surveillance in nature, which is necessary. So I don't think the PDP bill in its current form, definitely. And even if clause 35 is sort of diluted and those powers are sort of taken away, I would still suggest that this should not be used for surveillance. We need a completely different law to look at surveillance. I agree. I think we need uh, a stronger surveillance uh, reform in the country before we can even talk about anything related to you know frt or any such things yeah. but um, i don't think that's going to happen <laughs> um my next question is that um the issue and why i brought up personal data protection also because that's the only law that you know that's on the horizon currently but it's not there yet and what the issue with that is it that um it allows us to stop the sharing of data. And it uh, it says that data should only be shared when it is necessary to be shared. And it should be processed only when it is necessary to be processed. But in the absence of those laws, what can happen is all of these systems can be connected. So in a situation where the AFR is connected to the NAT grid or the centralized monitoring system or NETRA, what do you think would be the ramifications to the right to privacy of Indian citizens? So I can bring this on. Yeah. Um, so it's it's exactly like you said, right? Um, at this point, there are no real protections outside of 
uh, the principles laid down in Puttaswamy. Uh, so in the absence of a personal data protection bill, there is a real concern that these databases, once interlinked, are able to use data that was you know, given by someone for a very specific purpose uh, to then target uh, individuals using mass surveillance. Right? Um, Again, like it, it raises issues of if I give my facial my facial information for you know which may be completely necessary for accessing a government service, does that then put me into the uh, database for the AFRS? It, it might, right? Now. We don't really know, and that's kind of where a lot of the issues lie: is the ambiguity around um, the current status of the databases, and until we have a much stronger personal data protection bill, I don't think we will have a really solid answer, and so. It, it sort of creates a situation where we have to fear for the worst in terms of individuals' right to privacy. That's exactly it, right? So in a situation when everything is connected, what could happen is if you walk down the road, that like the government will know what where you're going, what you're doing, who are you talking to. They can tap your phone. They can uh, listen to uh, your conversation. They can see where you're going. So like 360 degree surveillance is something that could be possible if all these systems are connected without any uh, safeguards in place, basically. Um, great. So do you think we should ban them? Then the next question that I have is, um, so IFF and Project Panoptic specifically, we have called for a ban for on the use of this technology, especially for government entities, for police and other security and intelligence agencies. Uh, I know that CIS does not have an institutional stand on whether we should ban or moratorium, etc. So I'm going to pose this question to all three of you. What do you think should be done? Is a ban too aggressive in this situation? What should we do about facial recognition? Let's start with Shweta. All right. Thank you. Uh, so definitely, so while looking at the ban of facial recognition, looking at say the the extreme measures like have like no regulation at all and then have a ban. So while uh, looking at the ban, what I feel is it's ideal, like that would be the ideal thing when there is no facial recognition where people are free or people are not surveilled where something that they can't hide, they can't, can't always hide their face. So that way, but I think the issue comes is in uh, making and actualizing the ban or how it will work in, in reality. So compared to, uh, hello, can you hear me? You can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, so reality, so in terms of like, if there is a ban, there will be definitely pushback from multiple stakeholders and it won't happen immediately. So there'll be definitely pushback from, for, for example, for law enforcement, there might be private companies whose, stay, who, whose uh, tenders or money is at stake or the data is at stake. So the number of stakeholders who might push against a ban. So this, because of this push and pull, there might be a time when there's a limbo where, again, these technologies can be used because there is no regulation at all. So I think there needs to be some regulation before a ban so that there's a way in that the opposite is so it's not just that if the ban is just lifted, then it is complete use of it. So I think there should be some safeguards in place. Yes, so I sort of agree with what Shweta said, but I think uh, they could be, because I think we've gone too far ahead. Uh, the government's deployed facial recognition technology, so a ban doesn't, is not gonna happen. We're using it for different purposes. So once we've gone through that process, and also I think to a large extent, I know people are also like, I think you discussed it early, Anushka, that there's not enough discussion around facial recognition technology and people are comfortable with it. So when you say it's going to be used from finding missing children, nobody's going to say it's a good thing, right? Why do you want missing children not to be found? That's going to be a pushback, right? So I don't think a ban is actually going to work because I think it's gone too far. And people also, to some extent, are very comfortable with saying, why, what's the problem, for example, having CCTV camera, right? It's right. What's the problem having that? So maybe we need, maybe if a moratorium, the main, I don't know, maybe a moratorium or maybe have some, get a law or get some, say, okay, these are the areas where you can have facial recognition technology. Okay, say, okay, these, like, if it's criminal purposes, why do you need it? But you don't need to use it for everything. You don't need to use it at airports or you don't need it for vaccination purposes. These are complete no-no. It should not, like I think Amar had also mentioned, not like act interfere in my access to services. That should not happen. So there should be a complete red line drawn in other places where you will not interfere. And if law enforcement wants it, okay, they can use it, may use it, but these are the, you know, the red lines for them also to use it. So maybe discuss it purpose-wise. So these are specific purpose that it could be used. And even then, these are the limitations that you can use it uh, instead of saying, because I think we've gone too far ahead and it's not going to happen. So, yeah. 
I mean, in an ideal world, I I would have imagined, but yeah, Aman. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think in an ideal situation, this we would just ban it. It would be really that simple. Um, I do think, however, there's something to be learned from certain other jurisdictions. So I think you know we skipped the international perspective section uh, in this presentation, but in that we were talking about um, you know how the U.S. currently has a bill uh, table in its. Uh, I think it's in the Senate, um, wherein they propose, you know, a moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology until, you know, they have stringent guidelines that regulate its use. Uh, I think the EU in its AI white paper had mentioned that there would be a five-year moratorium on the use of FRT. So I think in the absence of a ban, which is, I think, you can all agree, like fairly unlikely, there should at least be, you know, there shouldn't be a gray zone where FRT is just allowed to run the way it is currently without any regulation. So a moratorium feels like the least that could be done while regulations are being created. Just to push back on that a little, I think even in the US, there are certain jurisdictions like, you know, cities which have banned facial recognition specifically for police. So, I mean, for police use at least till the time this technology is not 100% accurate and we know that it will not be misused. Shouldn't it be, you know, banned or shouldn't it, like you you are talking about a moratorium, but do you think that there is any situation in which police use of facial recognition can be justified even if we put these safeguards in place? Uh, personally, no, but I think it's more about like whether it's going to pass within the political context of India, right? Like I think with an exact... I don't think this is, you know, inherently uh, an issue that will go away with, for example, regime change. Like, I think we have instances of, you know, governments across the history of India being very pro-surveillance. Uh, so I think, you know, it's unlikely to, again, I, I agree, like it would be ideal if we could have, you know, individual cities in India outlawing, uh, you know, increased CCTV use, for example. But, you know, with news like Delhi is now the most CCTV. Yeah. <laughs> in India, it's it's it doesn't lead to a lot of optimism for me, at least, uh, on this actually being feasible. Uh, yeah, Delhi is on another path entirely. <laughs> uh, um, so I wanted to ask you guys, and I think Shweta would be the best person to answer this question. Where will this research series go now? You've already done, you know, FRT in India, like a basic, what are we, where are we, and, you know, by the legal framework and everything else. So what is the next thing that you will be looking at in this series? Right. So in, in this series, yeah, the continuing part of the paper, we're looking at, continuing part of the research we're looking at. First, we're looking at the number of uses of FRT in India, just starting down the uses. So the multiple that have come up just in these four or five months itself. So in terms of educational institutions, for examinations, and these weren't what we, I think we started with deciding on the research, we didn't know these new uses are going to crop up. So definitely looking at what are the potential or the, what are the uses of FRT in India? Like what are the uses that are cropping up in public and private enterprises and organizations? And also just looking at, again, as have we discussed, whether there's a ban moratorium or what type of regulation should be for FRT. So just look at uh, civil society organizations, academicians, researchers, and what they are looking at, how should FRT be regulated and what is the spectrum of regulation that can be there between a ban and having no regulation at all, so how the situation is right now. So just look at what are, what are civil society voices, of, what civil society and academicians talking about how FRT should be regulated or what are they considering, what are they thinking about FRT, if not if just regulation, but just looking at, okay, you know, they say, okay, regulation is difficult, but even that itself is another look at how people are thinking about um, FRT and regulating it and, and and I think how it is in India and what they think about it. So I think our, our, for new, like our continuing research will look at that. I think one of the things that I am most interested to find out is how this evidence is going to be presented in court. If the police continues to use it, I mean, what are they going to say? Is this, is this expert testimony? Is this uh, witness testimony? How will they present it and how will the court take it? I think it's, it's something that is also extremely, is going to be extremely interesting okay. to look at, I think. Okay. Um, so the last question before we go to the audience questions is to each of you. And that is, what is the one clear takeaway that each of you have had from working on this paper and on this research series, um, specifically with terms of, you know, 
how do you feel about FRT now that you've done this paper and what do you think is the one main thing that you would tell anybody who asks you, okay, oh, FRT, what is the issue with it or whatever? Let's start, start with Aman. Uh, yeah, I'd say just probably the extent to how how ambiguous it all is, right? Like, I think when I when I, I joined the research a little later than Pallavi and Shrata, and I think for me, it was just shocking to see the extent to which it was used and completely not formally, formally regulated. And I think that was, for me, the biggest takeaway in that, you know, any new technology that's introduced so rapidly in a society clearly needs proactive uh, legislation and proactive regulation before it's become so widely adopted and causes all these problems. That is something that I also struggled with because when we started Panoptic, we were just like, okay, there are a couple of systems. And then after one time, we were like, oh my God, there are so many systems and there is no regulation in place right now. I think we're tracking around 75 systems across the country and there is no regulation at all. Nobody is talking about it in the parliament also and it's really scary. Uh, Pallavi. Yeah, I think it's exactly what you and Aman have just said. I think I started looking at it and thinking, okay, maybe law enforcement is using it. I, I didn't know what FRT was, I mean, to be fair. So I was like, okay, maybe law enforcement is using it. Maybe it's used for certain purposes. But then when you started figuring out, okay, it's being used by airports, it's being used by private entities. And then said, okay, by schools. And I, for the longest time, I could understand why do you need it in schools? Why do teachers need it? What is the purpose behind using it? It could be used for delivery of services. And that's where I got, it's, it's become like very, not ubiquitous, just that it's all over. And very few people even understand the concerns. I mean, not. I don't think even I understood for the longest time as to what could be the probable concerns that could come out of it. And I think from your project Panoptic, we keep seeing like you keep rolling out that these tenders have come like every day. What is happening? Like there seems to be new tenders of FRT that keeps coming out. So that's how and how fast it's sort of been rolled out. Like it's been rolled out, and I think like Aman also mentioned, there's been barely any discussion in Parliament. There's been any barely any talk about it. Uh, FRT with, with vaccination was as barely a like a item in the newspaper what happened to that nobody knows so i think that was a little scary that it's just being rolled out without any legislative framework either way it's like if you want to roll it out okay but at least have some framework and that's sort of been given a bypass and so that people are okay with that so that is what was scary and sort of a little shocking to me shweta uh yes adding to what aman and pallavi and you stated uh i think for me the thing would be how yeah how it's like uh, by looking at by looking at looking at the ai uh, researchers looking at there were like articles about frt there was like newspaper reports but now you can actually see how it's actually being deployed and how fast it's being deployed so i think questions around that again between even though different versions of pdp bill out the pdp bill is not out but sometimes i when we used to look at pdp bill as a solution for this i think the more i go read more about frt the more i read the go back to the pdp bill i look at how pdp bill is not the answer to the FRT, to facial recognition or to mass surveillance uh, but but particularly facial recognition and how it, that that is that is early it is to be like okay there's the pdp bill need, need to be out or it should be passed and then things will be better but i don't think it will be better at least with regard to frt you know, the, the pdp bill coming out in the current version that it is so yes i agree i think the pdp bill the exemptions that it gives um I mean, it will not be able to tackle FRT at all. Uh, so as we talked about earlier, we need surveillance reform in the country for targeted surveillance as well, uh, not just new provisions for mass surveillance, but also the existing provisions, they need for to sure. be reformed before we can move forward, especially in terms of how fast the technology is developing. So that's all from me. Thank you so much to all three of you for all of your insightful answers. Uh, now I'm going to ask you a couple of audience questions that have come in from the YouTube live stream. So the first question that has come up is, could you talk a bit more about targeted surveillance? Uh, similar to, US, to the US, are Muslim and DBA communities and localities more likely to be surveilled by CCTVs compared to affluent sections? Anybody who wants to take this one? Uh, I could just do it. I think, yes. I mean, I think I'm going to also refer to it that you do find out that CCTV cameras are being, and in fact, we were doing some research for COVID purposes. And at that point of time, when you figure out surveillance that COVID was using, at that time, we figured out that 
I mean, drones were at what what I Maharashtra, you know, Mumbai police were using drones to figure out people who were out of quarantine, and they were using it more in Dharavi in areas where Muslim were there or Dalit communities were there rather than affluent uh, colonies, and which was obviously targeting a particular section, a particular community. So that does happen, and the ten there is a tendency of obviously your inherent biases coming forward, right? No technology is going to be without inherent biases, so they are going to use. targeting a particular community and which we saw like i said during covid surveillance where they using technological covid surveillance drones and cctv cameras are being even cctv cameras are being deployed in areas and localities where they think there are more muslim people communities or dalit communities what they believe or you know the, the system of communities which they believe are not not affluent section they're not they're not in the affluent section they're more in places where it's considered to be dangerous areas so Yeah, there is going to be more targeted surveillance for particular communities, which I think I think Amman referred to. That is obviously surveillance of particular communities, but yeah, those FRT mechanisms, those CCTV cameras will probably, and I I think somebody does the research will probably find that they are deployed more in those areas too. I think that's also because uh, introducing new technology is not going to solve the inherent mm-hmm. inherent biases of. Yes. policing in india yeah. so if these communities are over policed right now generally with this technology also they will be over policed it's not that introduction of this technology is going to solve the policing exactly. issue in india i think that is one of i one of the you know main things when you talk about this tech solutionism uh, mindset that the indian government has uh, i think that's one of the things that has to be kept in mind uh the next question is um are there any existing policies uh being worked on in india to ensure ethical data practices in like in terms of programming or such technology both in big tech and government agencies um, okay i can take this i'm not aware of any specific ones that look specifically at ethical data practices i think often times what happens is that you will see governments introduce technological measures and as part of the justification they will have principles of ethical uh, data practice integrated in their reports or in their justification for those things though i think um you know those can be fairly inadequate at at the best of times um so yeah i think you know and again i think it just comes back to what you're saying i think you know in terms of it's unlikely that ethical data practices or policies around ethical data practices are going to be passed anytime soon when uh, i think like shweta was saying that the idea initially was that the pdp bill would just solve everything right and i think it's unlikely that as of now that there are going to be any specific um, you know practices looking at uh, you know how to use uh, use a data outside of what is already in the pdp bill right uh, so just to add along with aman is also i think with government documents also with privacy policies of companies they say we use reasonable security practices or we use privacy practices but they don't specify what so i think that in terms of like having those words used but not specifying what are the security standards they use so i think that it's just another issue yeah um we're going to take one more question but i think we do have time uh, do you think cs bias mitigation researches to deal with algorithmic bias can actually be helpful for a country as complex as ours tech solutionism could be a help or policy is the only way to go and um by this it's okay pallavi and shweta okay yeah i think um often times like i i'm sure there is definitely a space uh, for cs bias mitigation but i think again like with frt specifically you know a lot of the problems that arise are from the database itself and those problems can be socio economic right so like if we go to the first question you see um you know there seems to there's an over representation of marginalized communities for example in the jail system so if your frt system draws data directly from the jail system you're going to create a bias system regardless of whether you you know account for that or not like your data set is inherently a bit tainted so i think you know the, while there is a space for uh, that kind of research i think we have to recognize that often times it requires perhaps like a mix of the two approaches uh, as opposed to any singular one anybody else has anything to say on that question we have another um should i ask um sure uh 
are there specific examples of FRT being used for education except CBSE situation recently or even where it might be used? So I could just answer that question. I think at one point in time, uh, the Delhi government, it wasn't like FRT as such, but what they had said was that any teachers, the teachers who were coming to school had to uh, upload a picture of themselves. And so that, that uh, you know, that if they've come to school and show that they're in school and do that and you know, take pictures and sort of register for attendance. Uh, and during COVID, I think it's sort of extended, right? So teachers have to take a picture and show that they're attending classes. And there's been a pushback by teachers, in fact. They say, why do we need to do that? You're, you, you don't know where the data is going, where are we storing the pictures? So by during, I think, at, I think it's 2019 itself, there was a push by the government to introduce pictures, uh, even I don't know whether it was for schools, but it, I think, or for colleges also, it, I think it was limited to schools and government schools, but teachers had to take a picture of them, you know, attending classes and say that we have come to class. And I think during COVID, definitely they said they have to take pictures and sort of send them and send the pictures up to them. So yeah, that's happened. And I think CBSC has also said, at COVID, it's a good way of sort of for college purposes, so people just take pictures and for COVID, for COVID and security purposes, it's a good thing to have FRT. I don't understand how it works, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's all, folks. Thank you so much. Firstly, I would like to thank all three of you for taking the time to come and talk to us today about your paper. It's an extremely nice paper, and I request everybody to go to the CIS website and look at it. They're, they're going to have more papers in this series, which I am personally looking forward to. Um, I also want to thank the entire IFF team uh, that helped make today's event happen, which includes Shivani and Ashlish and of course Apar. Um, lastly, I want to thank our community, which engages with us so eagerly and purposefully whenever we organize such an event and they send you such nice questions. Um, if you're interested in volunteering for Project Panoptic more closely, please do write to me at anushka at internetfreedom.in. Thank you to everyone who attended the talk today and I'll see you in the next.